The West Texas town of Kachina began in the 1880s with the building of the railroad. This morning, they are celebrating Frontier Days with a parade. There is a rodeo and barbecue at the fairgrounds this afternoon and a fireworks show tonight. Let's go watch a train come into town. It looks like he's stopping at the west end of town. Probably a meet with the morning passenger train. Kachina has a small yard and engine service facilities. The engine house was built in the early 1900s. They still do some repairs, but most work is now sent east to Fort Worth. The block ahead now clear, the switch is thrown, and the engineer eases open the throttle. This is cattle country. Here's a small herd being driven to the shipping pens up ahead. The freight has orders to set out a needed car. More cattle are expected for tomorrow's big shipment. Besides these cattle pens, Mike Paul, who is a good old boy, also has the biggest ranch in the area. Mike, with scuffed boots and a sweat-stained hat, will show up later this afternoon. He will make sure the men get fed and don't get too rowdy. Their set out complete. The conductor gives a highball. Looks like the engineer is trying to make up some lost time. He had a late start and there were some other problems. It's not been a good day.
We'll be able to get ahead of him here and get to our next photo stop. Came in over a dusty dirt road. Ranchers here generally truck cattle in to be shipped. Flats happen. Probably ran over a mesquite or cactus thorn out at the ranch. Here she comes. Across the tracks, there's an oil storage and loading facility. This is an older field. A few abandoned wells and the rest only pumping part-time. Still, a lot of carloads move east each week. There goes an airliner, probably out of El Paso. They've sure cut down on railroad passenger traffic. Cactus Canyon Bridge. You have to watch where you step around here. It's easier walking around the mines at Gringo Gulch. There's still a rusty spur at the abandoned Red Eye Mine number 2. And of course, spurs go out to the operating mines in the area. The railroad maintains a water tower and freight house here. But Gringo Gulch living conditions are pretty primitive. Maggie Gonzalez takes in their washing and provides board for most of the miners living nearby. The miners and mine owners are now putting up the needed larger building for Maggie's use. 900 is stopping for water and they will handle some freight before moving on west. At the west end of the gulch, the abandoned Red Eye Mine building is now used by hobos. Slow freights coming up grade makes it easy to catch a ride. At the east end, the original Red Eye Mine, the first one here and still in operation. Across the tracks, the more modern Lucky Lady Mine. Entertainment is limited here. Cards, checkers, or maybe a game of horseshoes. One miner has taken up flying kites. Work completed. 900 was moved to the west end of Gringo Gulf siding. Then, another long wait for a meet with this eastbound now working up grade.
It's about 20 minutes to Emmerich, the next town. It's been a long day, and the hog law is about to catch the train crew. The conductor will probably contact the dispatcher from the Emmerich depot. There's a spur north of the tracks to several industries, including a crushed rock supply company bunker, several metal working and machine shops, a gas and liquid fuel distributor, and on the corner across from the depot, a Jack's Glass. Across the street from the barbed wire fence that marks the southern boundary of the neighboring Shane Ranch is a small trucking company and the Rawlings Furniture Factory. The Emmerich team track is located next to the depot and gets lots of use. Most of the town and the business district is on the other side of the tracks. At one end of Main Street is a small public park next to Al's Tavern. Across the street, a drugstore and small hotel, then a shoe repair shop, Davis Transfer and Storage, a pool hall, oh, looks like there's been a small disagreement. An Ajax class crew is replacing a window. I guess the freight's staying here. They're breaking up the train so auto traffic can use 2nd Street. On down Main Street is the Tivoli Theater, a malt shop, and Woolworth's Five and Dime. The repaving of 1st Street is temporarily disrupting sales at Walschlager Motors, but the noise has had little effect at the grammar school next door. There's a lumber yard just beyond the playground fence, but McGowan's Lumber is closed this afternoon for the funeral of its founder. George McGowan was a church elder and civic leader. He'll be missed. Hey, they're supposed to be in school. The City Hall is at first in Maine, next the library, and then Miss Ellie's home, the only private residence left on Main Street. She did raise a ruckus when the Sheriff's Office was built behind City Hall and the jail put by her back fence. Beyond Miss Ellie's, a couple of businesses and a gas station at the edge of town. Sun's down, but the next crew hasn't shown up yet. The drugstore will be open until 9, and Ikovsky's staying over to complete work on a pair of boots for a waiting customer. Streetlights just came on as people head home for supper. I hear that a train crew has arrived in town. Not many people left on the street. The theater and a few businesses are still open. Of course, there's a crowd at Al's. I'm going to go watch the freight finally leave town. Well, that's the railroad, and it's all contained in this 14 by 48 foot building. We are in the backyard of R.D. Moses, president and CEO, who has invited us to take a behind the scenes look at his railroad. Welcome to Kachina, I'm R.D. Would you like to come in and see the trains? 
on in. Welcome to the Western Division of the Texas and Pacific Railroad. In 1983, a 14 to 24 foot building was erected. My good friend Jack Luck has been indispensable in advising and showing me flag design and various ways to do scenery and building display. I am going to turn this over to Jack now, where he can elaborate and give you more detail. There were three limitations in the design of this railroad. 24 inch minimum radius curves, 3% maximum grades, and all tabletop areas must be reachable from an aisle. I like to use quadrille ruled paper for preliminary drawings and sketches. Each quarter inch square can represent a unit of any scale you choose. No ruler is needed, you just count squares. There were a lot of false starts and rejected ideas, but finally a track plan that appeared to work. Next a one and a half inch scale drawing was made. Using five foot wide bench work, the island layout would fit in the available space. Translucent drafting paper lets the track plan show through, easing the design of the bench work. Track supports not more than 24 inches apart. The height of each riser was then calculated and a list of material compiled. The bench work of 1x4s was assembled on the floor using wood screws. Pre-cut, pre-drilled 2x2 legs were then bolted to the assembly. Risers were located per drawing and installed. Then, 3-inch wide sub-road bed, cut from 1/2 inch plywood, was screwed to the risers. The track center line was marked on the plywood. Next, the cork road bed and flex track were installed using only contact cement to reduce noise. All rail joiners were soldered. Except for dust, track problems have been almost non-existent. Well, a couple of turnouts did get glued up when we were doing scenery. I prefer using a wire screen base for scenery. You can bend and form it to the desired shape, then step back for a broader view. You know what the finished look will be before the plaster ever goes on. The aluminum screen can be cut with scissors. edges are secured with staples. Screen to screen is backed by small blocks of scrap wood. Just don't staple your fingers. The first coat of Hydrocal, a very hard plaster, available in 100 pound bags, is used for strength. First applied to edges and seams. It hardens quickly, makes the screen almost immovable when filling in the spaces. A finishing layer of molding plaster will be applied over the hydrocal. Slightly softer, it takes paint well, is great for use with rubber molds, and is easily carved. Hand carving the rock face of this cliff will give the look we want, and is in this case easier than using rubber molds. The white plaster is painted with earth colors using artist acrylics. 
The ochres, umbers, siennas, and lots of titanium white are mixed with water in small batches. This provides variation in color and is splotched on with a brush. Fine sands and ground foams come in many shades and colors. They are sprinkled over the painted surface as a ground cover. Coarse ground foams are now applied to simulate small brush and bushes. A fine spray of water with a few drops of detergent is misted over the ground cover to remove surface tension. Then a 4 to 1 mixture of water and white glue is carefully applied to the surface. It looks like spilled milk but will disappear when dry and the surface can be vacuumed. Add a few large bushes and trees and the scene comes to life. A background mural for the railroad was planned from the start. Mike Paul, a top-notch modeler, is the artist. A gallon of sky blue interior latex paint was purchased and rolled on to the entire four foot high surface. The horizon line was marked with easily removable charcoal. Then the entire latex sealed area below the line was blocked in using brown colored oils. Mike is now painting in the details, which will enhance the appearance of unlimited space. That's kind of close quarters, isn't it? Yeah, I'm working the opposite way. Because I know we're 18 inches from the uh, layout to the uh, backdrop. That's not close quarters. Kibbies was like this. <laughs> yeah. No kidding, I had to cut the handle off the brush. Distant mountains are blocked in. And a few more details to finish it up. I saw him. He just put a tree up there. Again? Yeah, yeah. He's got some trees on that mountain. I can see him deliberately planting them. And <laughs> grow right here. Yeah. This end wall came down in 1991 when the building was enlarged. The 24-foot extension had to be skewed due to property boundary limitations. The end wall was built parallel to the original wall, and the corners were curved to make the room appear even longer. The mural was extended as far as possible to add to the effect. Modifying a 120-degree track curve under this mountain provided the interconnection with the new area. The mountain itself was drastically cut down to form this mesa. The railroad was originally designed to be run by one or two operators. The control panel was built on one eighth inch masonite. It has two throttles, uses block control, and has switches to control lights, sounds, and other devices. Steam and diesel sound units provide track power as well as sounds. With the exception of the marching band and crowd noises, an ongoing project. All sounds heard during our tour are permanently part of the railroad. Turnouts are remotely controlled using lighted push buttons. Electrical contacts on the switch machines transmit the actual turnout position back to the panel. The new addition has a similar control panel for a third operator. Track detection causes an indicator on both panels to light when an interchange block is occupied. This assists in a smooth transfer between operators. All structures must contribute to the look of West Texas of the 1950s and 60s. Some were built from kits, some came from hobby shop use tables, and when not otherwise available, some were built from scratch. Most structures have added detail, which may include interiors and lighting. Here at the workbench, a shoe repair shop is being decaled. Next, 
measurements are taken. The interior walls, ceiling, and floor are cut from cardboard. They will then be painted, detailed, and fitted to the structure. Floors and buildings may be mounted on a piece of 1 8 inch masonite. The masonite is then fastened to the layout and light wiring completed. If painted gray, the piece can become a concrete foundation or adjacent sidewalks and curbs. This method allows easy access for future maintenance or adding detail. Exaggerated perspective is used. Simplified, the biggest is closest to the viewer, such as these trees. Here, the telegraph poles are progressively shorter and closer together as you look to the right. The viewer knows the poles should all be the same size, therefore they must be further away. Trestles are both timber and driven pile type, each designed to fit a specific location. They couldn't be easily obtained, so they had to be built from scratch. A drawing is made of a single bent. This one was for the high trestle. Place the drawing on a board, cover with wax paper, and make a jig using small finishing nails. It's now easy to cut and glue any number of identical bents. You can add bolt detail for the ones that will be up close. Hundreds of trees have been made and planted. The many mesquite trees have soldered wire frames and foliage secured with rubber cement. Some are only one inch high. The operating jack was built for the oil patch. It is 20% smaller than the idle jack in the foreground. This helps perspective and adds motion to an otherwise static scene. Here are some pieces for a second operating jack. This ranch scene started with a sketch. Assembled at the workbench, then installed, and a few more details added. Only the windmill is from a kit. <laughs> the water tank is a plastic pill container. Well, that's how we are creating West Texas and the TP Railroad in miniature. R.D. and I have enjoyed showing you how we are putting it all together. A place where you are the engineer of a thundering, ground-shaking steam locomotive or a trackside train watcher who still gets a chill when he hears an echoing whistle in the night. There are new projects as we attempt to make this limited space even more realistic. We hope you can drop by again and see if we're successful. Trains. They can be habit-forming.